Well, thank you for coming, everybody. Come on in if you want. Okay, be that way. <laughs> <laughs> My name is John LeBlanc. I'm the Vice President of Performance Design. It's been there for about 35 years. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again. I missed last year. I don't know what I was thinking, because this is a great place to be. Um, I'm talking about parachute design, testing, and development. And um, this was a challenge to put together, because I only have 50 minutes, and we're starting late. Um, people want to pump my brains dry when they ask questions, and it uh, feels a little funny in there right now. Um, they're asking me about things that I really didn't want to put in here. Um, but what I wanted to do is just cram it in and see if we can get through it, okay? So let's get cracking. <laughs> Cute. We're all like that. <laughs> so I'm going to talk mainly about the testing methods we use, um, test jumping, um, the design tools. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I, I did many years ago, but people keep asking us questions about what we're doing and everything, so I don't want to leave you guys wanting on that area. But I want to rush through that area because I really want to talk about the kind of weird stuff we've done, some unusual projects, a little bit of history to give some perspective. Um, somebody, I think it was you, that just walked up and asked me about the future. I don't remember who it was. Oh, there you are. Yeah, he said, can you give us just a little snapshot of what's coming five years in the future? Um, I can now describe why it's difficult to discuss the future, because we're not there yet. Um, I remember sitting at a party in, with, at Bill Booth's house, who invented the three ring and the hand deployed pilot chute, and I was so excited to be in his presence, and they were, we were just going crazy, he'd been drinking a lot, and uh, I said, so, Bill, what's happening in the future? What's coming? What's more in developing? And he goes, well, not much, really, and I went, <gasps> and he goes, well, I've already, Bill speaking, of course, not me, I've already invented the three ring release, to make cutaways safer, the hand-deployed pilot sheet to make deployments better. Um, I have built the main and reserve integrated on the back, which at the time was called a piggyback. And um, ram air parachutes are here. They have built fabric as small as it possibly can get without falling apart as light and low bulk. And they've removed all the reinforcing that they possibly can from the parachute without it falling apart. So nothing's going to get any smaller. And everybody knows you can't build a ram air parachute smaller than 200 square feet or it's going to land you hard. So we're done. And I was like, ah. And then just two years later, I was jumping a 150 that I'll show you here in a little bit. So it's really hard to predict the future. It's really fun to create it, though. And it's been a good, uh, a good ride for us to have been participating in that in the past, and we hope to in the next five years and on. So let's get going. Design tools. Um, we, there was a buzzword 20 or 30 years ago, CAD. Oh, do you use CAD? What does that mean? Uh, Computer-aided design. We don't even use that term anymore, do we? But uh, we've been using computers at uh, PD to design parachutes um, for about 30 years. Um, pretty basic, slow stuff back then, but we're still at it. Um, we actually built and designed a computer-controlled laser table to cut our parachutes more efficiently on those clunky computers. Um, we actually had two silicon graphics workstations to drive that thing, and now about it pretty much runs on an iPad right now. But um, we've changed as the technology has changed. Um, 28 years ago, we were doing laser cutting on our computer table that we designed in-house. Um, there's a word people have been using lately, or a term, parametric modeling. Um, it facilitates parachute design. People want to know if we do that. We started about 27 years ago designing our own program to, to take the mundane, repetitive, draw this, draw that, insert this, make that. It's really boring to do that. It takes uh, you know, weeks and weeks to design a, a, a new elliptical canopy, even without cross braces. And this program that we started uh, using 27 years ago in its infancy takes about four or five minutes for me to have a completely new design ready to, ready to cut, which is really cool. Um, 3D design, I'm also hearing lots of questions, um, and I never really thought much about it, but we started 3D design 28 years ago, and some people think that was revolutionary, and I, we really never thought to speak about it because we weren't the first back then. Um, kind of seems logical that if you have a three-dimensional shape, you would design it in 3D. Um, obviously, it's changed a lot and become more so sophisticated since then. 
Our parametric model, the one that helps us design parachutes very rapidly, we've always called it the smart model inside because we kind of think it's pretty smart, the idea, but also the way it works. Um, it was designed in-house by Bill Coe, the, the uh, founder of Performance Designs, for building proto or designing prototypes very rapidly. And uh, the first version of that program was actually used for us to design the Spectre and the Silhouette. They were our first elliptical canopies or non-rectangular that were not supposed to be super high performance and we weren't quite sure what airfoils and plan forms and aspect ratios and trims. So we just banged the heck out of that parametric smart model, did a bunch of prototypes very rapidly. Uh, it was just a matter of a couple of days from idea to prototype in the air and it came up with what we liked and the Spectre and the Silhouette are still well liked parachutes these days. The modern version of that is the, what we call the Z3 model, and um, it has super, super capabilities. It's actually not a new model, but it was very forward thinking because everything that we have in the design of parachutes like the Valkyrie or the Peregrine, our cross brace, super high performance, crazy parachutes, all the capabilities that we needed to design those parachutes were actually in this Z3 model, which is about 15 years old. We do a few modifications outside of it, but it's very minimal. Um, this program will generate completely new prototypes with completely different uh, shapes um, in a matter of minutes. It, it, with the computer I have now, it's about four minutes from idea to ready to go to the laser table. Um, there's 1,700 variables that we manipulate. Some of them are yes, no, but a lot of them are infinitely variable, like what airfoil do you want to use? Um, the plan form of the parachute, infinitely variable. The, the cell configuration, we can do from one cell parachutes, if you'd want, to uh, 66 cells. Uh, any number of chambers in the cell from one to, I think, nine. Um, every line configuration and trim, cascades, no cascades, airfoil shapes, inlet shapes, and then this really subtle and really cool inlet, uh, surface shaping uh, uh, capability that we have that helps make the parachute more and more efficient. It's really fun to use this. Um, also, it, it doesn't just des make the aerodynamic design, it does the structural design with all the seam allowances, tape locations, the exact intersections of those tapes so that they go where you want to put your, uh, your line attachments, the match marks that are put on the parachute to sew everything together precisely. It's all there and again, in about four minutes. Um, we can output that directly to our laser table. Don't have to do any templates or anything or to our CFD software. And I put that in there because people keep asking us about CFD. Do we use it? Do we like it? Well, we started doing what I would call relevant CFD work, meaning it wasn't a toy, um, about four years ago. Um, it, does, it does have some benefits. Well, we haven't quite drunk the Kool-Aid and drowned in it yet, but um, we use, uh, people want to know what programs now, and we use CATIA version five and also a program called COMSOL. Comsol is, I think, not as well known, but it's, uh, in a way, a more simple program, and some people would think more crude. Um, why would we use two programs? Well, because each, each has some advantages for our system, but also some clunky disadvantages, uh, lack of speed or, or ease of use. So we go back and forth between the two to, uh, to meet our needs. And our needs are specialized because we have um, interfaced both of these programs directly with our smart model so that the design work is uh, fluid and rapid and we don't have to do a bunch of manual, <laughs> a manual labor. We want to go quickly, quickly from one prototype to another. And of course the, the, three, the computational fluid dynamics is, is supposed to help us with that transition, but it's not something we actually use on every single prototype. And it does have limitations mainly because the shapes that the parachute take when it's inflated is constantly changing when you're flying the parachute and you have to make lots of assumptions and build them into your three, your CFD uh, programmed model um, to, to, to do the flow. And you get pretty pictures and lots of flow and it really is helpful, but there are these assumptions that we make in there. One of them is that the parachute's somewhat rigid and of course, as we know, it's only so rigid. But it's great stuff and I think it shows promise and we'll continue to use it. Okay, moving along. Oh, let me show you a couple of, of uh, pretty pictures of some of our CFD. That's the flow of air showing the direction and also the speed. Um, here's a side view and I actually have two parachutes on top of one another. 
There are two parachutes that are very slightly different. These are similar to a, a peregrine, but not exactly. Um, this is the internal pressure, because we want to look at that as well, and the external pressure. Internal pressure on the left, external on the, uh, on the right, and, uh, and then, of course, we look at the, at the combination of the two. And some people are really impressed by that. I'm impressed with the potential that it holds for the future. But quite frankly, I like to design something getting in the air and see what it does. And then we dispense with all of the assumptions we've made in the model, and we get to see what it does in the real wind tunnel. Okay? We'll continue to do that stuff. I want to talk now about the basic cycle that we go through with R&D. And this, this is something we've been doing for a very long time, regardless of the tools we use. We start with some design goals, and we put them into a project for a particular canopy or a particular research goal. Um, there may be as many as, let's say, from typically about five projects to about uh, ten projects that we're running simultaneously, and they each have a project lead whose job in engineering is to make sure that we get the resources applied to those projects to move forward. Of course, they have different priorities. Some get a lot more attention than others. Um, basically, we design a first prototype to meet those design goals, and we build it and jump it and see what it does. We just throw it on and jump it and we evaluate the results, and they're usually not meeting our, our desired goals. So we have a choice. We can uh, modify the parachute or build a new one. If it's a simple modification we want to try, we'll do that. It might take, you know, a few hours or even a few minutes, or we may have to build a new parachute to do that. And we really don't mind because building a new parachute's easy because designing it's easy and quick. It might be five minutes, and then bam, another one's being built. We continue to repeat until we reach our design goals. And we never have a design goal, a target, of a, of, a per, of a delivery date. We'd like to get something on the market, don't get me wrong. But if it's not something that's meeting our goals, we keep working on it. And sometimes for a lot longer than we want. On the other hand, sometimes it's much quicker than we expect. That's why it's hard to predict the future, especially if you're doing something that's never, ever been done before. You want a type of performance that's never been done before. Sometimes you stumble upon it really quickly. And sometimes it really is stumbling upon it. And other times it's very frustrating and a long, long ordeal involving hundreds of different iterations, thousands of test jumps. It's sometimes really hard. But it's just the way we want to do it. We built about 2,000 prototypes, almost, um, since we started actually putting numbers on them got difficult when we used to say in the old days, well, did you jump the blue one or the red one? And <laughs> after 2,000 or almost 2,000, it makes it difficult. So they've, we've done thousands of adjustments on those. And um, in some cases, we make one jump on it. We go, nah, <laughs> bin it. We cut it up and throw it away. We actually cut them up because people actually like to search through our dumpster. <laughs> we've seen some really shagged demos for, for sale. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, so, um, but sometimes we might do 25, 30 different itera uh, iterations, little adjustments on the parachute, and usually they're like little line adjustments, but sometimes we'll replace end cells, we'll replace center cells to do something different. Um, at some point it got difficult to keep track of all the test results, so we created a logbook, a computerized logbook, and uh, I think we did that about in 94, just at the end of the Spectre and the Silhouette development, and we now have over 45,000 test jumps in that logbook. Those test jumps, though, sometimes, you know, especially when we were a two-person company, you know, it's like, you want to jump this? Sure, you know. It was, let's just say, volunteer effort, but we don't do that anymore, really. Uh, we have a responsibility to the community to not have the community be our lab rats, you know. <laughs> We, we hire and train people for that. We pay them. We have a separate company we do that with. It's called Deland Research Corporation. It keeps the, the risks separate. You know, the risks of sewing parachutes are getting stuck with a needle. Um, different risks in, in test jumping, right? Um, we don't include our long-term testing in that, because this is a data collection thing. We have data on 45,000 jumps, and we want to be able to search it. But many of our jumps aren't that kind of jump. It's, we have a new fabric, we want to see how it lasts, and we need you know, thousands of jumps on it. And we don't need an elaborate log of every one of those jumps. We just need somebody to do it. So they, we get somebody, a volunteer in this case, somebody who's really wanting to help us, and we'll make, you know, we'll say, send it to us every 100 jumps. 
and then we do extensive testing on what it's like, compare it to a control sample, send it back, and we really appreciate the people who are willing to do that with us. But that's not those 45,000. There's probably at least about that many jumps uh, with those people that are not logged. So the test jumping, I mentioned DRC. We do it through a separate company. Um, there are challenges with test jumping, and it involves test jumpers and also the equipment. Um, I want to show, to demonstrate this, some unusual testing. Nothing really too crazy in terms of new and new in the future kind of stuff. Uh, a little bit of that, but not much. Um, but I want to just show you some weird, goofy stuff to illustrate what we go through as test jumpers and devising tested. I'm going to show a few mistakes, um, hopefully ones that I made. but. Uh, and then I'll, I hope to show how this relates to the evolution of parachutes. Um, problems with uh, test jumpers and testing is, is basically because we're people. <laughs> we're strong personalities. We're skydivers. Um, very often, people come to us and want to work for us in this role, and they're way overconfident. They're fearless. They think they're indestructible, and it's a problem. Um, one of my... Um, milestones that I feel we reach is when a test jumper who seems to be fearless goes, nah, I'm not going to jump that. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, Whew. you are now scared, so I'm no longer scared about you. Um, they often have too much blind faith in the so-called science and theory of aerodynamics and stuff, and a lot of that stuff isn't quite as cut and clean as, as you might read in a textbook or be hearing from a seminar. It may seem that way for a little while, but uh, it isn't. Too much faith in the designer. Um, people sometimes think, man, you're, you designed the velocity. Oh my goodness. You know, I'll jump anything you, uh, you put together. And they, they completely trust it. And it's stupid to do that with a new design. Some, sometimes things are pretty simple and easy. But sometimes we know that there's some marginal issues with particular prototypes. And we should approach it very cautious. And we do. But sometimes we, we do something that seems completely normal. And it surprises us. Um, lack of experience with a wide variety of parachutes. People like to jump what they jump. They pay their money, they jump, and pretty soon they have 7,000 jumps on a stiletto or something. They don't know anything else. Getting to be a jack of all trades is really difficult for these people. They also have a certain way of flying their parachute. It's difficult to, um, sorry, it's difficult to get people to challenge their mindset because your mindset gives you security that everything's going to be okay, and it's hard to jump out of that comfort zone, so to speak. Uh, things, terms like elliptical, semi-elliptical. Were you guys here two years ago and saw my, my uh, seminar on plan forms? I talked a little bit about this. Here's one of the things. When, when a test jumper says to me, well, yeah, I mean, it wasn't a very good landing, but I mean, it's only semi-elliptical, so I, I need a fully elliptical. I, you know, I've got to swoop it. I'm like, you know, terms. They're buzzwords, just like... Uh, uh, ZP and, and F-111 back in the old days. Nobody would let you jump a ZP canopy unless you had a couple hundred jumps because it was fast, but it, it really didn't work that way. So these buzzwords come and go, and to me, fully elliptical, semi-elliptical are those. Just to recap from that little seminar, here's the, uh, the velocity. And that is the plan form shape. The leading edge is at the top, trailing edge is at the bottom. And that canopy most people would think of in our sport as fully elliptical. It's high performance, fast, cross brace, zero P, tiny, experts only, right? And um, somebody who's more conservative wouldn't choose something like that. They would choose something more conservative and semi-elliptical, like a Sabre II, right? So here's a Sabre II, semi-elliptical. Now, when people speak about semi-elliptical and fully elliptical with me, I usually know what they're getting at. But the distinction be between the two in terms of strictly plan form terms is pretty blurred. As you can see, they're pretty close to one another. Now, in my world, that's, there's a big difference in that. But you wouldn't really think that the shapes are dramatically different, are you? would you? The idea is that, obviously, the parachutes fly quite differently. And it's not just because of the plan form, because if it was, you would expect very, very different plan forms. There's a lot of other things that go into the parachute, some of which you can see, the cross braces, obviously, and they don't do what most people think they do. But there's a bunch of other things, hundreds of other things, that you are invisible to you as, t as uh, jumpers. And what's really funny is that when we make a subtle change to a parachute, and I design the difference, and I know where it is, and I know why it is, at least I think I know why it is, if I look at the two finished prototypes in that area, 
and I compare the two, I cannot see the difference because the difference is so subtle. And much of the advances in parachutes are because of things that you really don't see. So we want to challenge mindsets. We also want to have some respect for what came before us, whether it's the, the parachutes or the people that tested them. This is Colonel Joe Kittinger, uh, Kittinger uh, who in, I think, 60, maybe 61, set the world altitude freefall record, one that stood for over 50 years. Now, what many people don't know is that this was not a hot shot on the drop zone. There really wasn't any drop zones back then, uh, or not many. But he had about 35 jumps when he did this. <laughs> All of them on what we now call unmodified rounds. They were basically emergency parachutes. Uh, really cool guy and a heck of a gentleman. I got to meet him in 2014 when he did an excellent keynote speech um, at the PIA symposium. What a man this guy is. Um, he's an aviator that I've seen for many years in Florida. I've seen him several times since, and every time he comes up to me and says, Hi, I'm Colonel Joe Kittinger, and it's like so cool. Um, you know, it's, it's great to, uh, to meet people like that in, in, our, in our community. I want to talk a little bit about my background in terms of when I started and the parachutes I'm jumping, but I want to look at it in a little different, and then I, I want to look at the parachutes and say, how'd they get that way? So that parachute on the left is my second parachute I ever jumped. That's a C9. They called them cheapos because nobody liked them very much, but it's a 28-foot military parachute that's modified. You see the big hole in the back of the parachute? How'd that get there? It didn't come that way from the factory. That's why they called it modified. Well, they actually taught me in my first jump course that they actually wanted the parachute to not just drift with the wind. So somebody said, maybe if we stick a hole in the back, it'll, the air will leak out and push it forward. So they literally took scissors and started cutting and hacking on their parachutes. You know, it, that's really how it happened. And they started doing different shapes and seeing that they didn't work, so they cut bigger holes and holes in different places. Eventually, it did start moving forward, but they wanted to steer it. They pulled on risers, it didn't work, so they put control toggles on them. It was a, this was all just the sport, the few people in the sport cutting and hacking on parachutes. And it's amazing, you know, like who did that? We don't think about that. And, and we, we used to really denigrate that old parachute, but it's really amazing because that thing had a three to five mile an hour forward speed, okay? That was phenomenal and you could pull a toggle down and it would go, and you could control where you went. And uh, three to five miles an hour uh, forward speed really helped when the maximum wind speed for students was 10 miles an hour. Do the math on that one. <laughs> yeah, lots of backwards PLFs. The parachute on the right is a paracommander, known as a PC. What a cool parachute that was. Man, I had fun with that thing. I was terrible with accuracy for a while because it had a 15 mile an hour forward speed. None of them flared, of course. Thing has 27 holes in it and steering lines going all over the place, little rings and stuff. Who? designed that thing, and how in the heck did the guy have the cojones to make the first jump on such a thing? You know, amazing stuff. So I, I respect what came before me, and I also respect <laughs> and admire all of the people who are still doing this stuff and will well beyond when I finally uh, get sent out to pasture. <laughs> that rig on the left is my first uh, piggyback rig. It's called a Wonder Hog. It was uh, a Bill Booth thing. Um, they called it the Wonder Hog because when they saw him go into the airplane down in South Florida, they wondered if that hog would work. And uh, that's what it was called. When I met him in DeLand, when I went to college um, in Daytona, um, he said, oh, that's the fifth Wonder Hog hand deploy I ever built. He says, I said, really? You mean that you, yeah, I built it, he said. And I went, wow, how'd you get that? You know, he said, he said, didn't somebody bounce in that thing? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> hundred bucks. The parachute on the right was the f one of the first ram air parachutes. Do we even use the term ram air anymore? Is that, that's passe, isn't it? Parachute with little holes in the front, air comes in. <laughs> um, that was called a, a paraplane. And it was the first ram air that was ever put on the market. It was actually put on the market, I think, 1969. Extremely scary. They're, the company that did it traveled around to show people how to not die with it. The lines were about three times the length of that. It had no stabilizers, no slider, no cross ports, subterminal open, openings only. You could not jump anywhere near another person, not for relative work. Um, and they were abandoned very quickly. The company then put out a parachute called a Paraplane Cloud because they knew it needed to be about 30 square feet bigger. Um, 
So we thought this was a paraplane cloud. A rigger told me that I could modify it and make it jumpable. And I was tired of jumping my PC, and I wanted to jump that cool rig on the left, that cool and groovy piggyback. So a rigger, who I had ultimate faith in because he's God, he's a rigger, um, he helped me, he directed me on what to do, and I ripped reinforcing tapes off of it. I pulled the lines off of it. I cut cross ports using a coffee can and a hot knife. Um, bought some stabilizers for a strato cloud because that was supposed to be a similar parachute, and a line set. We put the lines on, waited for the stabilizers. When they got there, they laid the parachute on the side at the drop zone. I'm all excited because I might jump my new parachute, and they rolled the stabilizers out. They were three feet too long. They said, oh, this isn't a strato. This isn't a paraplane cloud. It's a baby plane. And I went, what does that mean? You can still jump it. So. That's my first jump on the canopy, maybe my third, I forget which, but um, that was a test jump. Nobody put those parts together before. <laughs> I was 18 years old and it was my probably 73rd jump or something. I was clueless and I was clueless that I was clueless. <laughs> and it, it actually worked, eventually I figured out how to land it and, and it actually made the parachute much steeper and cruising at the ground, which made it more swoopy. So if you ever wonder why our parachutes are sometimes steep and swoopy, it's because I started that way. <laughs> um. So I was a test jumper and didn't even know I was a test jumper. I went through college, got my degree in aeronautics, and was right there at DeLand and seeing people like Bill Booth do great things. And, and before you know it, I started what I call my postgraduate studies, which was to heck with my, my aeronautical career. I'm going to live in my van at the drop zone and play with parachutes. Um, met the guy on the left, actually, in school. His name is Bill Coe. He's the founder of Performance Designs. For whatever reason, he had just as crazy a background in old parachutes as I did. He had a parasled and a hornet, um, strange parachutes. I'd do anything to not jump that paraplane, that baby plane in the middle, and he had some stuff and I was jumping it and I got all excited and he let me start cutting and hacking on fabric and I never left to get the real job. That's a first 150 right there on the right, first 159 cell that, that, I, that anybody that I know of has ever heard of. Um, remember just like a couple years earlier, Bill Booth said nothing smaller than 200 square foot would ever be good and I'm wearing Tevis sandals there. Um, we kept playing with parachute design because it was fun, but they were always different and not what we expected. And pretty soon these parachutes were leveling off and flaring so good. But there was this problem, is that the more we made the parachute flare, the more slidey it got. And the parachute kept going woohoo like this. And I thought, what is wrong with my understanding of aerodynamics? And Bill Coe used to like take pictures. And I looked at this one and I looked at it again. That wasn't me. That's not me. I've got 300 jumps now. I can land a parachute on my feet. And then I realized there were some things going on during the landing that I was clueless, that I was clueless about. So I started watching, and I noticed that all the time, but nobody was talking about it, nobody at all. And so I started talking about it and pissed off just about everybody on the drop zone. Hey, you know you can get a better landing? And it's like, go away, you little weirdo. <laughs> I, I learned a little bit about tact over the, la the next 30 years, um, and that actually began the basis of what we now call um, canopy coaching, <laughs> canopy piloting. Um, as we got better and better designs and we'd give them out as demos when people actually be willing to <laughs> try them, um, people didn't want to hear. You know, they'd come back and they'd tell you all about whether the parachute was good or not, and you'd see them crater in because of a piloting error, and you couldn't speak to them about it. Well, you know, you gotta keep your toggles level. When you flare, you gotta flare evenly. And they're like, who do you think I am? I've got 500 jumps and a D license I land on my feet every time. If I didn't on your parachute, the parachute's wrong, not me, you know? And I realized that that can happen to anybody. <laughs> and it happened again and again, even at the velocity, I rediscovered that problem in me because the smaller you go, the more sensitive it is and the problem comes back, okay? So it was pretty interesting. I was having a great time. I was going to go to my aviation career eventually, and again, I just never did. Fast forward to when we moved to Miami, because we needed people who would sew, because people were loving the PD-9 cell. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the cross brace and where it came from. This is not the first one that I built that was cross brace. This is the third. This is the first 110 square foot parachute F-111. Oh, to be young again. Um, I want to show kind of what the logic was. You see this parachute on the left, on the lower left? That's an old paraglider, actually an English one called a, it's a parascending canopy called a Harley chute. Anybody that's as old as me or older might remember that. If you look at each cell, there are not one but two non-load ribs in it. And because of the lift, it lifts upwards and distorts the cell kind of into this arching thing from one cell to another. I built a 135, or actually I didn't build it, I, I cut a 135 nine cell as a sewing experiment, or sewing uh, lesson for a new hire. I just thought it might be helpful. And I put twice as many ribs into it because you'd get twice as much sewing practice on the seams per top and bottom skin. And she put it together immediately, quickly, like right from the start. And I went, well, maybe we'll do the top seams too. And she went home and I go, that was amazing. I wonder what that thing would fly like. <laughs> so I sat there and I put bottom seams in it. I put lines on it, tailed it and went out to the drop zone that Wednesday and jumped it. And it was weird because I expected, because of what I believed to be true about cells and aspect ratios and all the stuff that I believed to be true, rigidly believed to be true, I put it over my head in the parachute. I expected it to be bigger and flatter. And it was like an accordion. It was squished in like this. And when I'd pull the toggles down to flare it, it would go and I'd let the toggles back out and it'd go like this. And it was really weird. And I thought, you know, if I put some lines on those other cells, on those other ribs, it would stay like this. So I did. And if you look up in the top left, this is not the first one, but it was a picture that I found. You see the, the A lines as they go up, they go into these triple spanwise cascades, and they basically hooked onto the bottom of those load ribs, or those, those non-load ribs. Now there was no reinforcing in those ribs, so I put a little tiny piece of tape on there and slipped it through the bottom. It was a real pain in the neck. And it didn't, I wasn't sure if it was going to hold together, but if it didn't, who was I going to complain to? So um, I jumped the 135 version like that, and holy cow, that thing was just cruising through the air. And when I hit the toggles, it got so quiet, and I was excited. So I shared it with the founder of PD, Bill Coe, and he jumped it. And he's pretty conservative on canopy size. It was the smallest he jumped. And he said, yeah, that was really cool. It had a lot of power in the flare, and it had a lot of speed, but all those lines, lots of drag, let's put that up inside the canopy. You know, instead of having an externally cross-braced canopy, let's put it with lines, put it inside the parachute in terms of a diagonally kind of cascaded ribs. And I wasn't sure it was going to work, I kind of, but he did it. There's the first cross-braced canopy, it's a 190, there's Bill underneath it with a fully inflated pilot chute anchor, he's dragging through the air. We used to normally put a grommet in the bag, a big grommet, it would slide over the pilot chute and kill it, um, but he, he didn't have one that day. Um, the inlet was too big, it opened too fast, it, it uh, packed too big, but it was cool. We built a seven cell version in the same general shape, so each cell was much wider, and that became the Excalibur. The inlet's a little smaller now, we built them from 260 square feet in the top of that stack all the way down to the first 120 that was ever put on the market. And uh, I learned a few things about um, road rash and grass on my jumpsuit with the 120. Um, yeah, Eagle gets a whack in this sport once in a while, doesn't it? <laughs> um, anyway, that was the Excalibur, and it started the whole cross brace thing. Now, it was F-111 parachute, and people bought them in really small sizes because we were all maybe not so intelligent. And when they wore out, they weren't so good. We'd already done the Sabre one at the time and put it on the market, and everybody forgot about it. The, um, can you start this video up there? Or did they all leave? How am I going to show you cool stuff if they won't play the video? Anybody up there? So this is the Excalibur Paraglider, believe it or not. It's a big old rectangle, 4.6 to 1 aspect ratio wing, 39 cells. And actually, it was actually quite successful for about a year and a half in, in America. It outsold all other European elliptical paragliders put together. And the reason was because it was stable. In those days, uh, paragliders were really unstable. They, you had to basically go, stay up there, stay up there. And they, they've gotten a lot better, of course. Um, we got out of that business because we realized that no mountains in Florida is going to be a tough, tough uh, thing to do. But um, 
they learned a few things, and obviously they use, they use uh, cross braces and paragliders now, and they're much more stable, but they have this term that they call active piloting. <laughs> That's a short words for do what you can to keep the thing inflated and over your head. Scott Evers wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't tolerate that. So um, I want to talk a bit now about specific test jumping, and hopefully we got enough time to get through these videos. We, we do a bunch of different testing, and it's easy to get down into the details and get all caught up that you forget the basics. So and in a way to keep us straight on the basics, I run around and storm and act preposterously pompous and talk about the prime directive. And it is that you must have a main canopy that you believe will reasonably work as your main canopy, and it must be something you can cut away. And if it's something you don't expect will work, it doesn't count as your main canopy. And you must have a reserve, a real reserve, TSO reserve, that cannot be cut away with you. And if you need other parachutes because you're not sure the first one's going to work, that means you need three parachutes. And both of all the ones you plan on using have to be something you cut away. If you want to get me going, break that rule. And somebody did, and, and it was all I could do to keep from um, getting violent with him. But he was instantly fired. That was easier. Um, he was jumping a main and a reserve, both of which could cut away. He was doing three parachute jumps, and then there were some two parachute jumps. He just got rid of his reserve and jumped this rig with the main and reserve, both of which he could cut away. And he insisted that he would pull the right cutaway handle if he had a malfunction. Uh-uh. Not in my company. Okay, there's one other part of the prime directive, and that is that sometimes you just don't feel good about something. And so I want any test jumper to refuse to make a test jump if they just don't feel like it makes sense to jump, whether they're hungover or whether they're, they think it's a really stupid thing to do or they're just afraid. I don't want anybody to make a test jump simply because they're afraid of losing their job if they don't. Here's a, an example of a test jump. I don't know if we can start this. This is a big cargo canopy. It's 800 square feet, and the, the, the uh, customer wanted to know how, we, uh, how long the control strike was, and we basically said, let's jump it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's a little weird, and because I want to be a company man, I was the guy in the middle. <laughs> Actually, I'm glad, though, because the guy in the front had the most difficult job. Do you see that, that exit? Really difficult to get out of the airplane. Um, really difficult. We put a jumpsuit on him on the next jump, changed, changed the slider. It's a, the parachute system weighed 85 pounds. Um, we could not even walk like that when we first put the thing together. So we decided to put the, the front guy in a rig and then he, we would cut him away in, for landing. Um, <laughs> for our, he does have a rig, and uh, this is at a 0.6 pounds per square foot. Watch how long it takes for the parachute to get to the ground after we do. And look at it compared to the size of those people and the, uh, the peas. Watch this thing come down to the ground. Here it comes. It's fun stuff. Um, the guy in the front, he had to kind of stand like this, and it was like doing one of those wall sits. Like his, his legs were like, come on, let's go, let's go. And it's like, no, let's wait for the spot. So. <laughs> So basically, we got the information to our customer about how long the control range was and how it turned. Um, they wanted to just do a bunch of math, but the math is the squirreliest when it comes to control ranges and amounts of slack and toggles and all that. Here's another example. This is the dual square test report. Has anybody heard about that? Something that we did back in, I think, the year 2000. Um, it's all about... Um, what happens, because at a, at a certain point, nobody would jump with you as an expert if you had an AAD, which we called an AOD in those days, till the lawyers got a hold of it. Um, because they were so unreliable that they were afraid it was going to go off and kill them. But then when they became solid state, and a few high profile people had low pull accidents um, saved by AADs, and one time not saved because he had it turned off, suddenly everybody jumped AADs, and now people won't jump with you if you don't have one. Strange how things change. But they obviously, people used to pull lower back there, and then there was a lot of two canopy situations where they threw their main out, and the reserve was coming out because of the AAD. So we, we really wanted to do something about it, because people kept asking us, well, what happens with two squares out? Because most two canopies out situations were with students that had round reserves in the old days. So we said, well, how can we test this? 
and do it safely but realistically because we didn't want to just invent something. We didn't want to say, oh, everything's fine, you know, or no, you got to. So we wanted to test it. But it really is both canopies coming out at the same time. So like, do you want to test that? Hmm, sounds kind of dicey. But if we did, we wanted to do it safely. What extremes should be tested in general, but also in this project? And, uh, you know, how do we do it? So first thing we did was we convinced the Parachute Industry Association that it should be done. And to make it easier, we told them we would do it. And um, we really felt like for the community, we needed to do this. And uh, the other tests that had been done before were kind of smaller in scope and ended up with more questions being asked than, than answered. So uh, we decided we'd go big. Um, we'd test every combination of main and reserve sizes. So small reserve, small main, big reserve, big main, big main, small reserve, small main, big reserve, every combination, because we weren't sure if they would interact together well. And just to make sure it wasn't a, a factor, we decided to do um, both sequences, the main first and then reserve, but also the reserve first followed by the main. And it did turn out different depending on the size of the canopies. So that simultaneous deployment thing, we, we, there was a lot of debate about it, but I said, we gotta do that. We just have to, because it's, somebody's gonna do it. We don't want people to be our lab rats. I mean, they get creative. We try to be as creative as possible, but sometimes the customers are very creative in <laughs> finding things to, uh, to do. Um, so we decided to do that. So that meant we need to follow with the prime directive. We needed a three canopy rig for most of those jumps. And for the, because we were thinking that maybe one of the canopies would be um, unflyable if they got entangled um, or something went bad, but we'd cut away one or the other, main or reserve, test main, test reserve, and we'd have a third parachute. But with the simultaneous deployments, we thought they'd both be a mess. So we'd probably have to cut away both of them, which means to follow the prime directive, you need to have a main parachute that you expect will work, reasonably work, and a reserve, so that means four. I can't remember where the cutaway handles and deployment handles were, it, you know, it was a long time ago, but I remember we used to religiously practice them in the airplane, and uh, people on the way to altitude would just laugh, laugh, laugh their heads off watching us go through the handles. We also thought we'd test whatever came along and that uh, questions we came up with. So here's a video of a typical dual square jump. Can you hit this one, please, up there? This is a, a main with a slightly smaller reserve deployed, and it looks pretty. Can you mute the volume, too? Thank you. It went into a biplane, and they flew around pretty normal. You didn't want to get crazy with them, but they turned and fl flew. This is the reserve first, and then the main, and it basically trailed the pilot chute, which we learned about, and then I pulled the pin, and I thought, okay, another day at work, another biplane. Yep, it's coming up right up into a biplane. Oh. So I flew that for quite a while um, <laughs> and cut away. That was my first down plane, but I had no one to share it with. Um, so obviously you don't want to um, land a down plane, but the, uh, the biplane, a lot of people were saying you should cut away the other canopy. Just, yeah, why would you fly two of them? They're going to mess up. Don't give them a chance. Cut it away. So go ahead and start this video, please. I didn't make sense to me. Um, so we cut it away, and ooh, look what happened. So we said, let's do that again. This is slow motion. You basically cut away the canopy, and it quits flying. And then you fly your <laughs> reserve through the lines of your main canopy, guys. Come on. That was like, whoa, it's like walking into a clothesline in a, in a dark backyard, you know? So sometimes it got kind of ugly. Uh, we did about, I don't know, 10 of these, and oh, this doesn't look good, does it? You want to cut away your main? And because of the prime directive, our guy goes for another free fall. You want to know what happened, right? <laughs> well, let me talk to you about employee turnover problems we're having. <laughs> No, he, he did deploy in the interest of safety, uh, or interest of time. I, I didn't uh, put it in there. Actually, it was clipped off the, the video, but he, had, he used a round reserve on that one. We had a hard time finding enough equipment in those days. But uh, anyway, um, because of the prime directive and because of practice and training, he was able to handle that pretty well. So let's 
oh, the uh, flare or not flaring on the biplane. Notice how that reserve kind of went funny when the main was flared. That kind of caused us some, some issues. So we said, how should we land these things? And we found that flaring a main in reserve without flaring in a biplane was the best thing. It never helped us to flare. If you watch this flare here, you'll notice the descent right does not change. But it's not that bad because you've got a lot more area over your, your head. Notice the parachute. You see the, what the main did behind that? If he'd flared a little bit higher, it was pretty ugly. Side by sides, definitely they're landable, but you definitely do not want to flare anything. We had some really good stuff I'd love to share with you, but don't have, don't have time for the video. Some people flare outside toggle on both canopies. That sends them into a down plane, guys. <laughs> I saw somebody do that in, uh, in Brazil, and he was open at about 6,000 feet, and he was determined to make that work. And he did down plane after side by side after down plane until he hit the ground like that and broke himself up. Wish he would have looked at that report, which is available on the PIA website. Okay, go look at it. Do not think of this as a dual square seminar. This is about test jumping. Don't make any conclusions from these tapes or these videos. Um, go, to the, go to the source. OK, I'll show you some dual simultaneous deployments. This is my first ever main and reserve deployment at the same time. Adrenaline was going. <laughs> kind of hurt, but they were up there and they flew. There goes the reserve pilot chute, and the main beat it. Here comes the reserve free bag. Kind of ugly looking, but it worked. We did a bunch of those, and uh, after a while we were thinking, maybe we should time it differently. Look at the burble on this one. But it still just kind of gets up there and says, excuse me, and gets up there and opens. I was amazed at how many deployments we had that didn't tangle, such that we actually tried to deploy one a little before the other to try to get them to go up there and make a mess. Here's, the, here's one attempt at it, right up underneath it, but it does its own thing, and four, four parachutes. I landed a 250, uh, uh, 126 reserve at 254 pounds after these tests. Watch this one. There goes the reserve. I'm going to wait a little while and let the main try to catch up. Look how close these, free, these bags are. And then, would you believe when they finally open normally, I went, darn! <laughs> <sighs> Watch this next one, though. This one gets really scare, scary, because watch where the main canopy bag goes. I think this is it. It's kind of like reminiscing for me. You'll bear with me, right? There goes the reserve. There goes the main. A little slow on that. Watch this main bag. It wants to go that way. <laughs> but then it goes to heck with that and comes back out. <laughs> of course, who am I in this role? My job is to be oblivious to it all. <laughs> I've got a hand, one in this hand and none in this hand. I'm going <laughs> So I was amazed at how well the two parachutes interacted with one another when they're connected to you. Wasn't too impressed when one of them was not connected, as in cutting away the front canopy of a biplane. I'm not going to make any personal, I have personal beliefs about what to do in certain areas from this, and I'm going to not tell you that right now. I don't want that to be misinterpreted. If you give me enough wine tonight, I might share a little bit of that to you on, as an individual basis, but not on tape. <laughs> this is a weird project. Somebody came to us and said, we recover satellites after they come down from orbit. We use a round parachute. <coughs> don't start the video yet. And um, they drift in a round parachute and go somewhere out in the ocean. And we spend a lot of money with a big ship trying to find it. And then it's waterlogged, and we've got to rebuild it. Can you make a mid-air recoverable parachute recovery system? We've tried it with rounds. They don't do well when a helicopter flows, flies over the top to pick it up out of the air. So can you do it with a square? Go ahead and start the video, please. So we built a, a, a very small square, because they wanted a, a long time in the air for a pack volume. And uh, we put these two little funny round things that we used to call this canopy the erotica canopy. Um, Anybody up there to start that, please? I don't know if I and so here's our test jumper with that parachute on the chest. First parachute here. There I go to pretend to be a helicopter. So the, the parachute's 75 square feet. 
F-111, trimmed for a very flat glide, has no flare, so it cannot be landed. That's why he has three parachutes. <clears throat> and my job is to pre pretend that my feet are a hook that a heli sticking out of a helicopter, and you grab this thing. They wanted to make sure the parachute collapsed when that happened, so it wouldn't interfere with the helicopter. And so it does. Yay. I don't have much crew, crew experience either. Um, <laughs> most of it with myself or with this. And then it reinflated, and then, and then afterwards the jumper cuts it away and deploys his, I think it was a stiletto main at the time. This is it's about 20 years ago that we did this. So he's going to cut away that parachute with a two-handled cutaway and then deploy his main. He's, when he gets rid of this parachute, it's like he just exited the airplane. He's got a normal rig. Cameraman wants to get the shot. Sorry for getting you dizzy. <clears throat> so you want to see my, my shot at that, my video? I'm going to blame the fire alarm, but we're going to go over a little bit. So. Look at the rig real quick. You'll see the parachute on the front. Those yellow handles are the cutaway handles going down the risers. <coughs> that was a prototype we chose just because it opened quick because the, the test canopy did. And I'm basically just maneuvering around and seeing how much up and down power I have. And I'm saying, well, you know, I got to do this, so let's make it happen. There's all kinds of weird things that go through your head when you allow it. And uh, when I got to about right, I don't know, about right here, I said, this looks good. Let the toggles up. Let's go forward. Ooh, this is working. And about right now, I felt like a carrier pilot ready to grab the arrestor wire on a carrier landing. Put my feet together. Please don't tangle on my feet. A little bit pull. Oh, it worked. And then I said, ooh, he looks like he's starting to turn a little bit. I don't want it to twist on my feet. I'll let him go. <clears throat> and then he cut away, of course. A Little bit weird. I told you I was going to show you unusual stuff. Um, so uh, this is the way we do a typical cutaway. This was, I don't know when, it was jump number 22,000, I don't know, I don't see it, 2007. Um, we have the jumper deploy the main facing backwards, and then the number two parachute is on the chest. And the reason is for safety, because number three parachute, the one he doesn't want to use, now the handles are normal for him. We used to do it differently in a different order and deploy out of this container for the test reserve. And, uh, it was a pain because we had to unpack a perfectly good rig to do the test, and then we had to pack it up to do normal tests. And a test jumper came up with this. I wasn't going to allow it um, until we could see that there was no difference in the results. Um, and so that's why we do it. Here's a super, super high speed drop test where no test jumper wants to uh, volunteer. It's 280 knots. That's well over 300 miles an hour, 340 or so. Can you get the sound on this one on? This is really cool. Boom. The entire rear riser system and control system went away, and then suddenly it flew on the front on the front risers only. There's nothing else attached. It makes you wonder about pulling the front risers farther. At a certain point, it doesn't do anything, does it? And it landed pretty fast because it was a lot of weight. That was a nine-cell version. We thought it needed to be stronger, and it obviously didn't work. Here's the seven-cell version. 285 knots, 500 feet, 346 pounds. This is a beautiful opening. I love it. Go ahead and mute it, please. So that was a less than two and a half G opening on a system that you can't see it here, and I, I didn't bring that video, but the same parachute with the same pack job could be dropped from a crane 110 feet high, and it opens before impact. Really strange, strange test that we did with lots of weird cutters and 
s dual speed sliders and pilot shoots that reefed but sometimes didn't reef and all kinds of crazy stuff. It was fun. We spent every bit of money we were paid to do that and more, but it was fun. <coughs> I do want to show what is like normal testing. This is a peregrine-like uh, parachute at very high altitude that actually flew quite well for a while. That's just letting the brakes up. <laughs> okay, whoa, that was kind of scary. Um, he's gonna land at a 7,000 foot field elevation. It's about 60 square feet. Um, the thing that's hard, remember I said that these guys are too confident in, the f in their designers and sometimes they're too confident. Weird <laughs> things happen when parachutes aren't what you guys hopefully end up jumping. I've actually pulled the front right riser on a prototype and the parachute started turning left. <laughs> because that side suddenly unstalled itself, yeah. I was silly enough to land that parachute. It was the hardest landing of my life. This is uh, a more recent test of something that I'm showing because it's visually different. Everybody wants to know what's gonna come. You, you heard me tell about the story about what Bill Booth's prediction was, so I'm not gonna predict the future. But I show this one just because it's not that bad. It's certainly not ready for prime time. It's a parachute designed to fly well and be aggressive, but in larger sizes at a wider variety of wing loadings than the typical Valkyrie or Peregrine. You can see things different. You can also see some things that uh, don't make a lot of sense. Um, you'll see some tail flutter on a turn here. Um, that's a surface shaping thing and an aer aerodynamic thing, and the the, we fixed that since then, but what you see in the parachute that's fixed, you cannot tell any difference looking at it. That's the thing that's frustrating to me, is people want something new, and very often new looks the same, but it's new. So we're having fun with that. That was in August. Um, I think we've gotten, on that one project, we've built, uh, I think we're on parachute number six after this one. It's not our highest priority. Um, but it is fun, so we're playing with it. It's actually a lot of fun. So this particular parachute, the riser pressure is too high. Um, the turns are a little weird, and it's got that flapping stuff going on, but we fixed most of that so far through those six prototypes and a bunch of revisions to the individual canopies. So. Before my time, quite a bit happened, and I have respect for those people that did that. And during my time, a lot's happened too. And of course, I'm grateful for the credit I'm given, but it's not me, it's the people I work with, and it's the community, the skydiving community. We had a lot of the ideas that are in the Peregrine in 1984. There's a video on our website that shows some 1984 stuff that's really weird. Um, but Nobody was ready for it, so when we design a better parachute that's better than the capability of flying it, we hope that people aspire to it and learn, and then eventually they go beyond it and they surprise us. So then we design a better parachute, and then you guys surprise us again. So it's, it's, a, it's a community. It's not just the test jumpers and the designers and the companies, but it's the customers who are willing to carefully step up to the plate and, uh, and give it a try. The guy on the right, I think of that as kind of, that's the 1977 version of what we now call something like blind man or, or all that freestyle stuff in canopy piloting. Yes, he is sitting on his slider. <laughs> and he's flaring by grabbing some lines. That's a 180 square foot uh, five cell. I've never jumped a five cell, by the way. Don't want to. Um, and obviously, that parachute on the side is, you know, 60 or 70 square feet. Um, I've participated in it and I appreciate it, but our company really is grateful for the chance that we've been given and the support we've been given to continue down this path. There was a lot of ridicule we received. I remember when I first brought the first 135 to Z Hills, one of the, uh, the British Marines said, now why on earth did you build that parachute? And why will you jump it? This makes no sense. And quite frankly, it didn't, you know, but, but we did and it's, it's been a fun ride. Uh, wouldn't, yeah, I'm done. So, did have a fire alarm though. Did you see that? <laughs> we've known each other for years. So we, we've, we've come up with better, the, the, the community has come up with better mains and reserves, wider range of sizes, better openings, better landings.
cross braces, yeah, that came along too. I think developing and sharing better techniques for flying and landing has been a part of our contributions and at least the contributions um, that we've been a part of. And that's it. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, thank you.